All right, this is the first video in a sequence of eight videos regarding digital filter design. In this video, we're gonna introduce just some terminology and basically review how the frequency response of a discrete time linear system works. So this is just part one. We're gonna kind of go through this introduction and the subsequent videos will actually get into designing digital filters using some different criteria. But for now, let's just review some of the basics, make sure we're ready to do those design problems. So first, just some terminology. When we talk about linear systems, we often talk about their filtering characteristics. And what that really means is that we know when we put in a single frequency into a linear system, the phase and amplitude of the output signal usually changes. So you might put in a cosine with a certain amplitude, a certain phase, what comes out of the linear system has a different amplitude and a different phase. So how that happens and how we quantify that is with what we call the system frequency response. So if you know what the system frequency response is of your linear system, you know how at every single frequency, any one that you want to query, how the amplitude and phase of the system is going to change the amplitude and phase of the input. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start just by reviewing those basic concepts. Um, I'm basically going to provide you or give you a discrete time system, and then we're going to figure out what the frequency response of that system is, and then we'll know how that system changes amplitude and phase of inputs. After we kind of review those basics, then we're going to get on to what I consider to be the more interesting part. We'll actually get to the filter design part of the playlist and actually design systems to have desired filtering characteristics. All right, so let's go ahead and kind of derive the, the fundamental relationship for discrete time linear systems and show how they actually do change the amplitude and phase. To do that, we're going to use the eigenfunction property of discrete time LTI systems. Basically, if I put in z to the k, where z is any complex quantity that I want, we know what comes out. What comes out is z to the k because it's an eigenfunction. That's just the definition of an eigenfunction. But z to the k ends up getting scaled by the complex number h of z. Remember, h of z is what we call the transfer function of the system. And if I query h of z at the specific point z, what comes out is a complex number. What we're going to do in the next few slides is we're going to show the following. We're going to show that when our input is cosine of omega k plus theta, so notice that is a cosine, which has a single frequency of omega, when that is the input, what comes out is this quantity right here. What comes out is also a cosine of the exact same frequency. However, the amplitude originally was 1. Now it has been changed by this amount. And originally the phase was theta, but the phase has been changed by the amount angle h of e to the j omega. So we see that when we put in a cosine, the amplitude gets changed by this amount. And we'll you know, kind of review and note that that's what we call the amplitude response of the system. And the phase has been changed by this amount. And that's what we call the phase response of the system. So let's go ahead and derive that relationship using really this eigenfunction property that is true for all discrete time LTI systems. One thing to also note is that this only works for you know, stable systems. So we're usually only concerned with stable systems. So this derivation assumes that the region of convergence includes the unit circle. And that will not be true for unstable or marginally stable systems. All right, so let's go ahead and do the proof now. So this is the property from the last slide. When I put in z to the k, what comes out is z to the k scaled by h of z. And that's how we're going to use this arrow notation throughout these slides as well z to the k yields this quantity. So that's kind of how to read that notation. So let's go ahead and use that general property and apply it to e to the j omega k. This is really just e to the j omega raised to the k. So it's like I've let z equal e to the j omega. So if z is now e to the j omega, what has to come out? Well, z to the k h of z. And in this case, z is e to the j omega. So I've replaced all the z's with e to the j omega. Similarly, what if I put it in e to the minus j omega raised to the k? So in this case, z is e to the minus j omega. What has to come out? That quantity right there. All right, so we know these kind of two input-output pairs. When I put in e to the j omega k, this is what comes out. When I put in e to the minus j omega k, this is what comes out. 
let's now find a way to use that to represent a cosine. Well, that's pretty easy. We know that if we add up these two things using Euler's, that we can get two to the cosine omega k. That's just kind of basic um, trig property right there. We also know that we're dealing with a linear system. And we know how linear systems work on sums. It just operates on each piece of the sum independently. So that means if I put in two cosine omega k, which is this sum right here, what comes out is a part due to this plus a part due to this. And we already derived what those parts were on the previous slide. The component due to this is an output here. And the output component due to e to the minus j omega k is this component right there. So if I put in two cosine omega k, this is the sum that comes out. And let's just work on that just a little bit. On this second line right here, I've just kind of factored out a conjugate. So on this term right here, I'm sorry, on this term right here, I factored out all the minus j's and then replaced it with a conjugate right there. So it's the exact same quantity. And then on this third line, what did I do? Well, you'll note that this and what's inside the parentheses here are exactly the same. So it's kind of like I have x plus x conjugate. Well, anytime you have x plus x conjugate, that's just two times the real part of x. So on this last line, I just use that basic fact of dealing with complex numbers. All right, so when I put in two cosine omega k, I get out two times the real part of that piece right there. Notice there's a two on both sides of that equation, so I can go ahead and divide both sides by two, which tells me an input of cosine omega k yields this right here. That's still kind of an ugly result. You know, usually when you have real part, imaginary parts in your math, I'm not a huge fan of that. So let's go ahead and rewrite the argument of the real function here, this h e to the j omega e to the j omega k. That's a complex quantity. Let's rewrite that in polar notation, and we can simplify things just a little bit. So this is a complex quantity. It has a magnitude. It has a phase. So I can write that as a magnitude times e to the j of its phase. So using this polar representation now, go ahead and plug it back in up here. And we end up with this quantity right here. And I had an e to the j omega k there before. It is still there. Using the property of exponentials, a product of exponentials, you just add their argument. So I can write that as one e term right here. And now things are pretty straightforward because the magnitude is a real valued number, so it can just get factored out. And then what is e to the j omega k plus the angle? Well, that's really cosine of that quantity plus j sine of the quantity. But j sine is imaginary, so after I take the real part, I'm left simply with the cosine component. So all that simplifies to this right here. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. When I put in a cosine at frequency omega k, what comes out? Well, still a cosine at the same frequency of omega, but its amplitude has been changed by this amount, and its phase has been changed by this amount. By definition, this is what we call the amplitude response of the system, and by definition, this is what we call the phase response of the system. All right, so that's exactly what we wanted to show. It's just a little bit of a review reminding you of how discrete time linear systems work. Given a single frequency input, they change that single frequency term in terms of its amplitude and phase. And we now have a nice equation that tells us exactly how that happens. Typically, the input to a discrete time system contains lots of frequencies, but that's okay. You can then query the frequency response of your system and know exactly how each frequency component gets changed. What we're going to do now is kind of use this to uh, compute some frequency responses of very specific systems. So in this, this kind of huge chunk right here in the subsequent videos, we'll work through each one of these examples and compute the frequency responses of different systems. So stay tuned and watch the next video.